Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar on lung technologies and impact on lung recovery practices. We have a very fascinating webinar for you and two great speakers. And before we introduce them, I have a couple of housekeeping items. If this is the first time you're listening to a webinar or joining us online here, um, if you have any questions for the speakers, you can actually submit them at any time, but we will be holding them till the end of the webinar. Just click on the bottom left-hand corner chat icon and type in your question. <clears throat> also, um, I wanted to share a couple of upcoming webinars with you for which registration is open on our Alliance website under the education link. Um, the next webinar is next Tuesday on September 26th on the topic of pairing the kidney selection and management for the dual transplant. And also coming up, we have a special webinar in October on brain death declaration, and this is taking a nursing perspective. And this will be on October 19th, so registration is open for that as well. For today's webinar, we are offering one CEPC credit, and we are also offering 1.2 nursing conduct hours courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. For all of you listening in today, you are able to claim these credits. All you have to do is follow the evaluation process. So if you're listening in a group today, I know many of you listen in groups, whoever registered for this webinar, whoever signed up and got the link and set up the room for you, they will be the one that um, receives the evaluation email. Um, so if you're that person, please make sure to forward this evaluation email to the entire group. And if you're in that group and did not receive it, please follow up with your group leader so that you can complete the evaluation process. Please note that for nursing, you have 14 calendar days to claim your continuing education credits. And for SEPSIS, you have 30 days. Okay, at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is Chris Janes. He is a member of our Leadership and Innovation Council, and he kindly organized today's webinar. He is the Chief Executive of Officer at Immunosep Medical Products, and I'm going to turn it to Chris to introduce our speakers. Chris? Thank you, Eddie. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, who both have deep knowledge and experience in the available ex vivo lung perfusion, or EVL systems. Dr. Pablo Sanchez earned his MD from the University of Cordoba in Argentina. He trained as a thoracic surgeon in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and then came to the U.S. for fellowships at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Maryland, where he was a member of the cardiothoracic transplantation and ECMO teams. Dr. Sanchez and the University of Maryland's thoracic transplant team were the first program in the U.S. to perform a lung transplant following EVLP assessment with the ex vivo perfusion system under the NOVEL study. Additionally, they were the first in the U.S. to perform a lung transplant from a lung perfused by an EVLP service provider under the Perfusic study. Dr. Sanchez is a well-published author in both EVLP and ECMO-related subjects. Dr. Sanchez is currently an associate professor and associate surgical director of lung transplant and ECMO and the Director of Ex Vivo Lung Perfusion and Lung Transplant Research within the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Dr. Gabriel Lohr specializes in the clinical evaluation and surgical management of patients with advanced cardiothoracic disease, including cardiac, coronary artery, aortic, and valvular heart disease. Dr. Lohr earned his MD at Northwestern University in Chicago and received his thoracic and cardiovascular surgical training at Cleveland Clinic. He spent several years at the University of Minnesota as assistant professor in cardiac surgery and director of the lung transplant program. There, he significantly increased the volume and quality of lung transplantation through donor utilization, reduction of patient wait list times, and adoption of various innovations. Dr. Lohr is the national principal investigator on several trials using ex vivo lung perfusion platforms to increase donor yield and quality. He is credited with the first breathing lung transplantation in the Midwest performed in 2014. His translational lab focuses on the use of EVLP technology to improve the quality and quantity of potential lung transplants. Dr. Lohr has published several key papers on prolonged preservation of donor organs with an emphasis on reducing ischemic injury and the inflammatory response. Dr. Lohr is currently the surgical director of the Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center Lung Transplantation Program. Please join me in welcoming these two speakers. Thank you, Grace. 
So this is Pablo Sanchez, and I'm uh, kind of in the middle of Wyoming right now, but I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of what we have done and a little bit of what I know about extreme position. I'm going to ask Heidi to advance my slides. So if you can go Hello. ahead and move to the next one. Yep. Dr. Dr. Sanchez, if you can get a little bit closer to your mouthpiece, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So second slide, please, the one after the title. So if you see here, I always like to bring everybody to the same point. And uh, this is a little out of date because it goes up to 2012, but it kind of, kind of shows the reality of what is to be a candidate and a potential recipient in the United States. You go all the way to the top and you see the gray line, there's a number of patients that are listed for transfer any year in the United States. You look right underneath the green line, that's the number of patients that are transplanted every year. And you can see that there is a gap between the number of patients that we have listed and the patients that we get transplanted. If you go all the way down, you see a purple line that shows the number of patients that become two sets in our waiting list to be transplanted. And the red line on top, you can see that those are the patients that die in a waiting list waiting for a lung transplant. Next slide, please. So what happened in 2005, kind of trying to reduce the number of people that are waiting and dying in, in our list, this allocation score was designed to prioritize patients that would benefit the most from the lung transplant. And as you can see there, that we were pretty successful at reducing the mortality of, of candidates in the waiting list, but at the same time, there was an increment on the people that became too sick to be transplanted and eventually those were removed or did not require lung transplant or were not provided with lung transplant. So if you add the number of people that die and the number of people that were not transplanted because were too sick, we're pretty much to the same point that we were before the line allocation score, which is around 500 patients per year. So you read, you see another graph, and that's something that we're trying to tap in more and more, which is the number that is this uh, different kind of donor is uh, called a donation after cardiovascular termination of death. Uh, and I just wanted to bring this up because even though we talked about it a lot, it's not a significant number of people, of donors that we use, of patients that get transplanted with these kind of donors. It's probably around 2%, maybe, maybe around 4% currently in the United States, but it's uh, not as many as, as you might think they are. So the main source of donors that we currently use in our big brain that donors. Next slide, please. So how did extreme perfusion begin? And, and for you, you may have heard the name of Steen or the solution named Steen. Well, it's based on somebody that is actually a cardiovascular surgeon in Sweden. And they were having the same problem. They have the waiting list, and they have not many donors. And they were thinking, what other sorts of donors can we have? So in 2001, he published his first experience with what we call uncontrolled DCD. So somebody that did not expire under a controlled circumstance. Uh, and um, the main problem with that kind of donor is that we barely know anything. We don't know anything about the history of that donor. We don't know anything about the quality of those lungs. So he needed to define or design a method to be able to evaluate those lungs. Next slide, please. And if you see here, publication of 2001 from the Doom Group in Sweden in the Lancet, in which he explains pretty much everything that they did, from the ethical standpoint to the extreme perfusion platform that they use, to the donor, and, and, uh, and so on, the transplant and the outcome. So this was his first successful experience of lung transplantation using ex vivo lung perfusion as a platform to evaluate lungs from an uncontrolled DCD. And the patient, the recipient, was a 54-year-old woman with COPD that lived uh, on without any complications. Next slide, please. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Sanchez. Yep. Dr. Sanchez, I'm sorry. We're getting a number of people mentioning they're having a hard time hearing you. It's very muffled. Are you using a headpiece? Nope. Okay. Uh, maybe just um, see if you can get a little closer to the mouthpiece and maybe okay. if you can slow down just a little bit um, so we can hear you a little bit better. Thank you. Sure. All right. So next slide. And um, is this a slide with extreme precision as a method to re 
a favorable quality? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here is what Stig designed his method. And you have to remember that the only thing that he wanted was to evaluate lungs. So well, are these lungs good or bad? That was the question. And what he did was to design a short-term perfusion in which he would perfuse these lungs outside the body at 100 car- 100% cardiac output with the left atrial open, and he designed a solution to which he added blood, <clears throat> and he only would perfuse it for a period of 90 minutes. And he would do uh, all two challenges during the ex vivo perfusion to define what was the oxygenation of these lungs. So this is what we now, uh, as the stick method, the learn method, or what eventually became the uh, vivo line method, which is one of the companies um, that are out there performing ex vivo perfusion. So as they were doing this, next slide, please, they thought, well, you know, we are evaluating donors from, from, from uh, donors after cardiac death. Can we use ex vivo lung perfusion to evaluate donors from brain death, uh, donors in which we believe that there's something that makes us do this award the quality? And you have to remember that uh, brain death donors are subjected to a number of injuries that you can see here from the mechanism of that to, to the mechanism of uh, the way we try to support them through, through donation as mechanical ventilation or hypotension or even the, the, the cause of that or the mechanism of that, the trauma uh, that can lead to aspiration or even pneumonia. So there are several donors that we cannot use just because of the quality of these donors. So if there is something there that we can uh, potentially use to revaluate these lungs uh, ex vivo, it, it will be useful to increase the number of uh, donors that we can eventually use for transplantation. So his group, next slide, please. And, and here is a little bit of what I was talking about, you know. Uh, only 25% of the lungs that we get offered are transplantable, and, and 75% are not transplantable. So if you can use ex vivo as a way to identify other viable organs in that not transplantable pool, it will be of great benefit. <clears throat> and uh, next slide, please. Here is a table that, that I always like to show. And... Um, and, and, and you can see the donor standard criteria on your left and, and the number of uh, patients or donors, actually, that meet those standard criteria and, and uh, currently. So as you can see, uh, most of our donors actually don't meet those, those criteria. And you can see on the lower part, with the title says guideline variances. So what is the number of zero is the number of donors that we currently use that deviate uh, from, from, um, from no criteria at all, from no viable, meaning zero would be an ideal donor. So if you see only 26% of the donors that we're currently using are ideal. Uh, and the rest of the donors that we're currently transplanting plants from are actually uh, extended criteria donors. But you can see we only deviate probably one or two criteria. When we start looking at three or four criteria, the number of donors that we use are smaller and smaller. So there are things in these donors that you cannot change. I mean, you cannot change the age of the donor. You cannot change the history of how many cigarettes they smoke, they smoke every year. But there are other things that you can change. You can change the presence of secretions or potentially improve their PO2 or eventually lead to resolution of infiltrates on an X-ray. So this is where Stig Stinnick proved so the potential of ex vivo perfusion. <clears throat> and in 2006, next, next slide, please, they evaluated for the first time uh, a, a group of extended criteria donors. Next slide. And, and this is the initial experience of ex vivo lung perfusion in brain dead with um, extended criteria donors. Uh, the publication was in the Annals in 2006, and it is in the European group. So when you look at the PO2s, it's in kilopascals, so you have to multiply it by seven. But pretty much what you're seeing here on your left is the, donor, the number of donors, and then in situ means what was the PO2 in the donor, and then ex vivo, what was the PO2 in ex vivo and perfusion. And you can see there it was kind of even a PO2. So pretty much like an ultra challenge. And, and all these donors improve their PO2 doing ex vivo, and at the end of ex vivo perfusion, all of them were transplanted, and these were donors that had been rejected by every single center in Europe. So eventually what she demonstrated here is two 
things. One is the potential of ex vivo perfusion to reevaluate or increase the number of donors that we are currently not using by reevaluating these donors ex vivo. And two, maybe there is a potential resuscitation effect that ex vivo might have, uh, mostly believed to be through the resolution of pulmonary edema. Next one, please. <clears throat> you have here probably the Toronto method of those doing ex vivo and perfusion. And, and, and in 2008, is the first publication that we have access to from CIPO and all, uh, in which, next slide, please, they made modifications to the Toronto um, loon system and they're demonstrating that you can potentially, by using the Toronto method, extend the time of perfusion. And, and, and this first initial publication, the 2008, was done in pigs with normal lungs in which you put them in the, in the exhibitant perfusion of Toronto method uh, and you can perfuse it up to 12 hours without injuring the lungs. So this first initial publication, the only thing that they really demonstrated is that the Toronto method is safe and you're not adding injury to the lungs by utilizing this method. Next slide, please. So what is the Toronto method about? Or how can, uh, how can Toronto can perfuse lungs longer? And pretty much what they do is that they reduce the amount of stress that these lungs are seeing. So remember that uh, tune or steam, they use 100% of the cardiac output, where Toronto reduce the cardiac output. Instead of using 100%, they will use 40%. So reducing the amount of stress of the pulmonary artery, the vessels, and the visual cells we're seeing. And then they close the atrium to be able to maintain a better vascular recruitment. The only modification that they did is that they saw that they didn't need any blood in their system to be able to do ex vivo perfusion and evaluation. So they actually took somebody, something that can be a little cumbersome, which is, you know, either using the blood from the donor or getting blood from the bank. And what they realized is that they could perfuse these lungs for a longer period of time, opening another door in ex vivo lung perfusion, which is the potential use of ex vivo as a therapeutic platform, meaning being able to treat these lungs when you perfuse in them ex vivo with different therapies. Next slide, please. So in 2009, they published the first results of their clinical use, and you have seen this as a New England Journal um, publication in which what they show is that uh, when you compare these 22 lungs, I think, that they did actually lung perfusion, that were lungs that uh, everybody had rejected for transplant because they had poor quality and they were evaluated ex vivo and they were deemed to be good lungs ex vivo, with lungs that were standard, the outcomes were equivalent, meaning the drug dysfunction was not higher, the, the number of days in the hospital was not higher, the number of days on the ICU, on the van, all those things were equal. So this trial demonstrated that if you go to use the Toronto method to evaluate lungs, uh, you can also increase the donor pool. In 2011, next slide please, in the United States, uh, at the beginning, we were four centers, but now there is up to 16 centers. Uh, um, the, the Nobel trial was designed, and it was pretty much based on the, the, the health trial. It was the same, pretty much the same thing. Uh, the, we only had to do it in the United States because the FDA required that centers in the United States uh, uh, that the technology will be tested in centers in the United States. And that's, that's when we started. Next slide, please. So if you see here the health study uh, next to the, to, to the Nobel study in the United States, pretty much we were doing the same thing. We were reevaluating high-risk donors or extended criteria donors in ex vivo uh, with, um, with ex vivo lung perfusion. And the, the way this will work is that the lungs were procured put in the cooler, transport to the center, and we evaluated at the center that was doing the transplant. Toronto demonstrated an 87% conversion rate. We at the Nobel trial had a 53% conversion rate, so meaning that out of the 40 lungs, out of 76 lungs that we put in the XVO machine, we transplanted 40, while Toronto has 23 lungs that they put on the XVO machine transplanted 20. Who would you compare this uh, transplant that use ex vivo lungs to. We compare them 
went to a standard criteria lunch, meaning lunch that everybody wanted. So we comp- if these trials had been called to be not really fair, because we were comparing lungs that nobody wanted with the technology that was emerging against lungs that everybody wanted to transplant. So many people have, com- have called these uh, studies to be a little bit of an unfair comparison, but at, at the same time, we had excellent outcomes. So it proves that even under the unfair circumstances, the technology works. The primary endpoint, so how we decided the technology worked or didn't work, in parental health study was primary blast dysfunction, Grade three, meaning severe primary graft dysfunction at day three, it, and uh, 30 day mortality, and in the novel trial was only 30 day mortality. Those studies have been approved uh, by the respective regulatory agencies in, in the United States. We got, had FDA approval in 2014. Next study, please. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows pretty much what we did. So we had uh, an X31 with lungs that were rejected by transplant centers because they were of poor quality. We flushed them, like we normally do, in the donor hospital. We put them in, in the cooler. We brought it to our hospital. We evaluated ex vivo. And if we saw that they were good, we transplanted them. And then we compared those lungs to lungs that were a standard criteria, so ideal lungs, uh, that were also that following the, the, the standard process of lung transplantation. So flush, preserve, and then transplanted. Next slide, please. What we uh, studied pretty much was how this machine, the ex vivo machine, was working. So this is a machine that has pretty much everything that you need to uh, to do it. You have the ventilator, the heater cooler, the cardio hub, and then you have a solution, which is called team solution, based on the doctor that decided in Sweden. Next slide, uh, please. So how did the, the perfusion work? So we had an offer from a donor, okay? <clears throat> that we that they had been rejected for quality. Uh, we saw that the that donor needed criteria, and we had a recipient that had accepted to the to the ex vivo trial, and we put them in the ex vivo um, machine after we procured them and we brought it to our center, and then we had to evaluate the lungs for a minimum of three hours, and we were looking at all those variables that you have there, the PO2 in the vein, in the artery. The, the differences between those PO2s, the airway pressure, the, the lung elasticity of compliance, and the vascular resistance. And if those parameters did not decay or improve, we transplant the lungs. And if those parameters worsen, we did not transplant the lungs. Next, please. So the biggest concern when we were doing this is that people say, well, you know, you may think that this lung is not, is not transplantable, but I think this lung is transplantable. So how, how did we avoid that? So we will not be able to have access to a set of donor lungs if they had not been rejected by all centers within a radio of 1,000 miles. So that means that all transplant centers that were in zone A and zone B had to reject those lungs because they had poor quality before we could accept them for ex vivo. That was the way that we, we thought it would be fair for other centers to make decisions about this quality. And as you can see here, uh, the lung the people were rejected around 39,000, and the, and the, all of them were offered outside the OPO region. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> here it shows you that the primary endpoint, which was 30 uh, day uh, revival, and as you can see, only one patient expired in the vivo group at day 10, and it had to have nothing to be related to ex vivo. It was, a, 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 it was a complication of ATG that the patient received as, a, as a, um, immunosuppression, part of his immunosuppression. And then we had uh, an unusual high survival in our control group. I mean, that's what I put the reference there. So if you look at the reference for 30 day survival in lung transplantation, is about 94%. So you can see that both our ex vivo group and our control group, their the survival was well above this. The 90 day survival, just to give you an idea, around the IHSLT reference is 88%, and for both our groups, none of those patients had to be the same. Next slide, please. These are all the secondary endpoints, and, and as you can see, there were no differences between the ex vivo group and the control group, meaning the severity of breast function of 72 hours was equivalent. The days on the ventilator were equivalent. The 
need for agnostic transplant, the, the number of ICU days or the hospital stay will appeal them between these two groups. Next slide, please. So to kind of close the external panel on this, pretty much the, the, the message here is that we took lungs that nobody wanted. We defined them if they were good or bad ex vivo. And when we defined that those lungs were good and we transplanted, those patients did uh, as well as patients that receive lungs that everybody wanted. Next slide, please. I'm going to just walk you pretty fast. This is through one of our patients. So, for example, this is a brain dead donor that was 20, 45 years old that uh, was found uh, in her um, bathtub, and he had a worsening PO2, and because of the suspicion of aspiration, nobody was taking those lungs, and they were offered. Nobody wanted. We took them. Next slide, please. We put them on a single position, and as you can see here, you can see that in the, in the top left, there's an x-ray at the beginning of x vivo, and below is an x-ray at the end of x vivo. And on the right side, you can see the compliance, which was excellent. It was uh, um, um, pretty steady. It never decreased. And, and below, you had a PO2 that was increasing during x vivo. So we thought that the funds were good, and we went ahead and transplant. Next slide, please. And for the COPT recipient, that actually right now, she's three years out. So she's, uh, she's doing very, very, very well. Next slide, please. I know that Dr. Lord is going to be talking about these things, so I just I just bring them to the timeline. But in 2012, we had the Inspire donor, the Inspire trial. Next slide, and then in 2013, you have the extent the trial. He's been talking about those things, so I would not be uh, addressing them. I just wanted to show you the timeline. Next slide. In 2014, because of uh, FDA requirement. What we did is that we increased the number of donors that, that uh, I'm transferring that it had to be studied. And that number initially, the Nobel trial was 42. We done 130 lung transplants with ex vivo and 130 transplants with uh, control lungs. And uh, we just included, well, just now, four months ago, we closed that study. And we are not in the process of preparing the data for FDA presentation to have full approval of this technology. Next slide. So this is pretty much what you have today in a field perfusion. You have vivo lung, which is that lung swedish technology. You have a field perfusion, and you have a transmetic machine. Actually, vivo lung was recently purchased by a field perfusion, so vivo lung machine is not really any longer available, the one that you have on your left. Uh, X3 and Vivo Line are one company right now. Next slide, please. So the other thing that uh, Chris brought to, to mention is this uh, facility in which you can procure lungs, and instead of having to do those, uh, perfu that perfusion in your hospital, you can send them. It's like a perfusion center. And for us, when I was in Baltimore, it was really convenient because we were in Silver Spring, so it was only like 35 miles away. And as you can see, this facility on your left, and then the old map pretty much has an next view perfusion system there in which you send them, they do the perfusion, and you can see real time everything that happens to your organ. You have like a high definition uh, cameras, you have uh, bronchoscopies that can be uploaded online, you have all the physiology data, you can see pretty much everything that is going to this organ from your own hospital. Next slide, please. And this, this uh, facility, what is looked at this trial, actually, uh, by, by Perfusics at the time and nanoland biotechnology, uh, what is looking at demonstrating is that if, if you follow this uh, mechanism or uh, way of doing an equivalent perfusion, it, it's safe, meaning shipping an organ from the donor hospital to Silver Spring or whatever the center might end up being, and then shipping that organ at the end of perfusion to your center, that increase in polyxemic time or that way of preserving the lungs, which is pretty much the, the Toronto the method, will not have an impact on, on your outcomes. And, and, and the protocol itself is it's the Toronto protocol, and the um, mean, the goal of the trial is at the same time expanding donor pools, so we're evaluating high risk donors. Next slide, please. I was asked, and I'm finishing now, I think I only have two more slides. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, the potential use of X0 in donation after cardiovascular uh, determination of that. And I, I wanted to bring up to you 
uh, this uh, report by the ITS of the International Society of Herlan Transplantation. Uh, this, is a, this is a voluntary registry, so it's not a lot of centers that send their data, but it gives you a perspective of what lung transplant centers are doing across the world. And if you look at your bar graph on the left and you go all the way to the end, which is actually on imperfection, you can see that out of all these centers or out of all these lung transplants, only 12% are evaluated. So what does this mean? This means that as people get more comfortable with the donation uh, DCD or DCDD way of doing, uh, eva uh, using these kind of donors, the need for retrieval and perfusion decreases to the point that some centers in, in, like in Australia or in Europe don't use exigo at all. And to your right, you can see those couple of minor curves in which you can, what the chart, that publication pretty much shows that the current the protocols and the current way that we do them, uh, we define if they're a good donor, we procure them, and we transplant them, that process provides equal outcomes to brain dead donors. So, pretty much showing that is, the, the DCD donor should not be considered an extended criteria or a marginal donor just because they are DCD. Next slide, please. On the other side, there is some potential for. Uh, uh, improving the quality of DCD donors. And this is a publication that came out of Toronto uh, in 2015 in the American Journal of Transplantation. And you can see in the left, the bar graph, um, we have blue, which is the number of DCD D lungs that were perfused ex vivo, and red is the number of DCD D lungs that were not perfused ex vivo. And in your graph on, on the right, you can see that these DCD lungs that were perfused ex vivo actually uh, had, uh, when they were transplanted, those recipients had less numbers of mechanical ventilation than others, less ICC space, less hospital space, uh, and, and there also was a trend on a reduction of permanent gas function. Uh, so is there a potential for, for ex vivo lung perfusion in this CD? Maybe. Uh, one, I believe, is that uh, to increase the use of these CDDs, it will bring some level of comfort or, or, or not comfort, but um, how can I say, a, 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 a kind, of a, kind of a secure uh, environment for new transplant centers that are not affiliated with CDDs as a way to reevaluate these lungs in the hospital. Uh, and at the same time, maybe the, the impact of ex vivo perfusion in these cases is through this potential resuscitation effect leading to better outcomes after transplantation. So if you look at the literature on ex vivo lung perfusion, all the literature, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you're doing vivo line, if you're doing ex vivo, if you're doing sound medics, or if you're doing perfusics. All of all that literature shows the same thing. It shows that the systems are safe. So what, what is going to determine what system we eventually use or systems? Maybe we will use more than one system. I think it's going to be regulatory, logistical. It's going to be potentially economical. And then it will depend also on the center preference. Next slide, please. And, and with this, I finished, and I'd like to thank you. And I'll um, give uh, time for, I hope, time for the next speaker, Dr. Laura. And uh, I guess we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sanchez. Uh, Dr. Lohr? You might need to unmute your phone. Dr. Lohr? Uh, to everybody participating, I apologize for uh, some of the audio challenges today. Uh, we had some unforeseen circumstances with the use of calling in. Okay, Dr. Lohr, we still can't hear you. If everybody can just hang tight for one second.
Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Dr. Moore. We can hear you now. Go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Okay, it's a real privilege to uh, be on the line here. That was, a, that was an excellent talk by uh, Dr. Sanchez. Um, I'd like to uh, just shift gears a little bit to, uh, uh, to a related but slightly different technology that um, involves the transportation of the organ uh, while simultaneously assessing the organ um, in hopes of achieving uh, what a lot of us want to achieve, which is improving the quality um, and the amount of donor organs that we can use for transplant. So I'm uh, Dr. Gabriel Lohr from the Mike Lee DeBakey Department of Surgery at Baylor St. Luke's. Um, by way of disclosure, uh, I, I did receive grant support for my involvement in the INSPIRE and the EXPAND uh, clinical trials, and obviously uh, a lot of this data, all of the data is uh, off-label um, uh, because we, we really don't have FDA, complete FDA uh, approval for any of these devices uh, short of humanitarian exemption or uh, research trials. So what are the areas of greatest uh, needs for innovation in lung donor management today? Uh, one of these is donor organ quality. Um, primary graft dysfunction, which is shown here in this x-ray, is still a major issue with transplants, and it occurs 30% of the time um, within the first 72 hours after bilateral lung transplants. Um, it's a process whereby the organ is transported, whether it be from across the street or from a very long distance, transplanted into a recipient, and it gets this white, whited out appearance uh, with an injury to the lung that is not explained by any other um, explanation such as infection or rejection um, or bleeding. It's just strictly a reperfusion injury. This still plagues us about 30% of all transplants in some severe forms or less severe forms. This particular form here um, is uh, the most severe form of primary graft dysfunction 3. If you do get primary graft dysfunction 3, uh, the chance of, of having a major complication such as death is about 33% chance uh, for, uh, for decreased survival in the hospital. Heidi, are you, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through good. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, there are both short and long-term impacts of primary graft dysfunction. On the short term, there's increased in-hospital mortality associated with it, um, whereas on the long term, uh, the, the grafts can have less survival um, over a period of five years out. Ones that tend to not have graft dysfunction on the front end are likely to survive longer. So it's it's important to understand that the quality of the organ up front may have a major implication downstream. We've even seen that that transient amounts of primary graft dysfunction, so primary graft dysfunction that occurs and then improves still has uh, severe long-term implications in terms of graft dysfunction. In this graph here, what you notice is that the controls on the top are the best outcomes. Those are the, the graphs that last the longest. The one in the all the way at the bottom is severe primary graft dysfunction. Patients who had that had the shortest um, life expectancy with their, with their new organ. And the one in the middle were the transient ones. So they developed primary graft dysfunction that went away. They still don't have as good a long-term function as ones that don't have primary graft dysfunction at all. So uh, on to a separate topic, which is donor organ utilization. So we, we do have an increasing amount of uh, recipients on the wait list, as Dr. Sanchez had mentioned, but yet 15 to 30 percent of patients are still dying on the wait list. In the face of that, 20 percent of lungs are being used and 80 percent are not being used. So what is EVLP and how can it address both quality and organ utilization? Most of us intuitively understand that the longer that an organ is outside of the body before it's transplanted, um, the greater likelihood of having uh, graft dysfunction or not having the lung work well when it's transplanted. One of the most common questions that we get is how far is the donor, how much time is it going to take? It's been looked at in many different ways. Some studies have shown you can go out to six or more hours. Other study, studies have shown you can't go out quite that long. Uh, but I think there's no question in most transplant centers that 
time is uh, of value, and we generally try to limit the amount of time um, that the organ is outside of the body. Right now, the way that we can protect the organ is by flushing it with Perfidex solution and keeping it cold so that its oxygen requirements are not that uh, significant. Ex vivo lung perfusion, um, especially the uh, normothermic version of it, allows the organ to maintain its breathing configuration, its temperature, uh, 37 degrees, and it essentially reduces or eliminates ischemic exposure, or in other words, it removes the amount of time that the organ is without oxygen. It also, at the same time, allows monitoring of the lung and potentially provides an environment for recovery. We've heard a lot about the ex vivo system, which is a phenomenal platform Dr. Sanchez described in detail. Um, I won't review the data, but uh, that system was critical in allowing us to know that you can put an organ into a device, and if it's stable on that device, it will be stable and good for transplant. The VivaLine system was also explored already, so I'm going to just go ahead and jump over to the normothermic system. So this is the, plat the platform. This is the Transmedics platform, um, and I'm going to kind of uh, show you a little bit about uh, how it works. So similar to the other device, it has a monitor. Um, it has a disposable module in the middle, which houses the lung. Um, and then it's all built into this uh, portable platform that allows you to wheel it onto a plane or onto the back of an ambulance um, or even the back seat of a car. Um, it uses blood that, to go through the, the organ, so-called cellular perfusion, um, but we mix it also with a solution that is not unlike the solution that's used for some of the other systems, uh, it just has slightly different sugar concentrations and packaging, um, and it's uh, so-called the uh, organ care system solution. One of the differences between these two platforms, theoretical differences, is that when you have portable um, ex vivo perfusion, then the lung is transported while it's on EVLP. So technically, from the donor to the recipient, it stays on EVLP, so we remove ischemia. Um, in order to have reperfusion injury, you do need ischemia. Uh, so the extent to which uh, a device can truly remove that risk, um, you should theoretically have less reperfusion injury. Now, that, of course, is the topic of ongoing trials, uh, but that is the hope. Uh, that's why a system was designed that was portable. Um, the other systems are not portable, uh, and they're obviously just as valuable, and, and there's a lot of research going on, ongoing on both, uh, both uh, ideas. There are two, fun two modes that the system functions in. Preservation mode is essentially like ECMO. It's basically giving the, the lung oxygenated blood that goes through the lung, and oxygenated blood comes out of the lung. So with this preservation mode, which is what 90% of the travel time on the organ care system um, is, this preservation mode basically does not make the lung work much at all. So oxygen goes into the airways, but it doesn't really matter to us what, how well the organ is oxygenating. On the monitoring mode, um, the, the blood that's going into the lung is flushed free of oxygen, so no more oxygen in this blood. So the only, blood, the only oxygen that gets into here is from the functioning lung. So that allows us to see how well it's working. Um, this is a short video, uh, which I'm going to see. Heidi, is it possible to play it? Yes. Okay, there it is. Thank you. Okay, so in this video, what you see is the monitoring screen. Um, you see the different elements that are captured, pulmonary artery pressures, peak airway pressures, hematocrit. You see the organ inside of the chamber. This is a sterile chamber. It's not reusable. Um, it's disposable, and it is sterile. It has to be used a new one with each run. That's one of the cost elements that comes into this system, um, is that each run you know, requires a brand new system. The overall platform is reusable, but not the module where the organ and the blood is contained. 
Um, the hookup you can see there, there's a cannula connected to the pulmonary artery. Um, there's blood flowing freely out of the left atrium and collecting behind the lung, and it basically drains passively into a reservoir and then pumped back up to the top of the system. Um, there's also a ventilator connected to the trachea that is inflating the lungs, as you can see there. So in this case, uh, the lung is filled and with uh, warm blood, so it is not being deprived of oxygen at this state. It's also theoretically getting the benefits of EVLP, and of course, we're able to monitor it uh, during this time. Now, going on to a little bit of the data that is uh, accumulating behind this, there were two trials that were mentioned. There's the INSPIRE International Trial and the EXPAND-1 International Trial. Uh, both of these are FDA-approved uh, trials. Um, there's an IDE for use of this platform only under these trials. In the U.S., you can't use this device in any other way. Um, and then, but however, in Europe, it is being used actually um, out in or outside of clinical trials. The INSPIRE trial was a pivotal trial. Um, it enrolled about 380 patients, um, and it, this was the trial that was uh, essentially mandated by the FDA to make sure that, uh, that the device doesn't do harm um, to the lungs, especially to standard donor lungs. What was a little unique about this trial is that it is the largest prospective randomized control international trial for lung preservation and transplantation and it compared uh, portable ex vivo perfusion um, to the standard ice preservation that we use, and this was in standard donor lungs. Basically wanted to answer the question, is warm better than cold? The inclusion criteria was aged younger than 65, normal gas exchange, no active pulmonary disease. The lungs had to be suitable for either the organ care system or standard of care. These were very standard donor lungs. So it was a very interesting trial in that it took standard donor lungs, placed them on EVLP, or compared them to ICE in a randomized fashion. The primary endpoint was the degree of primary graft dysfunction 3 or survival. The donor demographics were shown here. The controls are mostly age 40 and a little bit older in the EVLP group. Um, final blood gases were pretty good in both arms, and smoking history greater than 20 pack was about the same in both groups. Um, in terms of uh, age of the recipients, uh, the OCS group had slightly older recipients. Uh, BMI was about the same, and the LAS score was just a little bit higher on the organ care system group, um, but on average they were very similar. Um, this just shows a slide that the peak airway pressure stay very stable throughout uh, the preservation on the organ care system. Pulmonary vascular resistance starts to ge generally go down over time while it's on the system. This shows us the, uh, the blood gases. So in the donor, um, the final gases were on average about 454. These are very good donors. Um, on the organ care system, the initial gas was similar, 462. And then OCS final was similar, 460. This is a very interesting slide. I, I like this because it tells us that the EVLP system is able to maintain the oxygen levels about the same across the board, whether it's on EVLP um, at the beginning or at the end of EVLP. So that's encouraging to the surgeons. When we look at the uh, ischemic time um, for, for the first lung on the cold group, obviously it has very long ischemic times, 296 minutes. By the time the second lung is, on average it was over six hours, whereas on the OCS group those ischemic times are much shorter, of course, because they're, they're not on ice, they're being perfused the entire time. When we look at the incidence of primary graft dysfunction when it, when it was used as prescribed, so that means removing the cases that were screened out, removing screening failures, just removing, including only cases that were performed as prescribed so the device was used properly and there was no error, no system errors, which, by the way, was, was relatively rare. But nonetheless, when we compare the per-protocol population to um, the, on EVLP to the ICE group, what we saw was essentially a 50% reduction in the incidence of primary graft dysfunction 3. 
um, which kind of jives with our understanding of, well, you need some degree of ischemic time in order to develop primary graft dysfunction. When you remove that ischemia, um, you should get that reperfusion down, time down significantly lower. However, when we looked at survival at 30 days, uh, or even at six months or even out to a year, the survival is about the same, whether you got your lungs with EVLP or without EVLP. And so this is an important point that um, we can still do a good job in treating patients with PGD, uh, even if they get the, the lungs strictly on ice, and we can get them through it, and we can actually get them to live out to a year. Um, we, the long-term follow-up of this is still ongoing, so we have to see the implications of it. In general, what we took home from the trial was that we seem to get better quality up front, um, but the long-term implications of it have yet to be seen. Um, so it's still going to be very interesting to follow this and to keep studying it and looking at it going forward. We saw important trends towards less ventilator time, less intensive care unit time, and less in-hospital time. Again, but mostly trends and still something that we have to continue studying. Of course, uh, I do have to point out these studies are uh, extremely labor intensive, and this is probably among the biggest studies that we're ever going to see comparing ICE to EVLP. When we look at the primary safety endpoints, which of course is critical to the, to the FDA and other priorities, um, OCS met its primary endpoint uh, when we talk about safety. There was no increase in adverse events. If anything, there was a slight decrease in adverse events. Now we switch gears for a moment to talk about the EXPAND trial. So good, we can transport an organ and we can minimize the ischemia, but now how about can we can we screen in more organs that we otherwise wouldn't have utilized, similar to what was described for the Novell trial? This is the conception of the EXPAND international trial, um, which uh, I had the privilege to lead and complete uh, during my time at the University of Minnesota. Um, this addresses the issue of organ utilization and trying to get at using more of these organs that were annually wasted. The donor criteria was much different than the INSPIRE trial. Here, PF ratios were below 300. The expected ischemic time was going to be above six hours. Um, donation after cardiac death was uh, allowed in this trial. Donor age is greater than 55 years of age. So it was looking at what most folks would still consider slightly marginal. There were important exclusions, such as uh, severe trauma to the lung, active pneumonia, persistent purulent secretions, um, uh, massive blood transfusions. Um, this was interesting. It did exclude patients with a pack year smoking greater than 20, um, which was a request from the regulatory bodies. Now, if we can play this video, I'll show you what the very first expand lung um, in the world looked like. So this is the, the, the first one that, uh, that was utilized on organ care system. It was actually a very different, um, very different experience than the standard uh, INSPIRE runs in that now you can actually tell differences. We, um, Heidi, is there a way to get the video to play there? Oh, okay, great. Well, I'll just, I can't see, but that's okay. So essentially, what we noticed was there were higher peak airway pressures. There were higher resistance. Um, there was a little bit more obstruction of flow, and the oxygenation wasn't quite as good. So it, what this told me right away was that lungs that are slightly extended criteria do, in fact, function differently on EVLP, and you can detect that. Um, this particular lung got better uh, over time. We had it on there for up to six hours. It was a DCD from an older donor, so it had two of the entry criteria. Um, we do a lot of DCD transplants, uh, but I thought it was very, very interesting how they definitely act differently on EVLP. So we'll have to see how, how we proceed forward with that and get these even better. This, this video here, if you can play it, just kind of demonstrates the portability of it so you can understand what I mean when I say it's portable. And we just we kind of drive it into the ambulance 
or place it onto uh, the airplane from there. This was the gentleman, the very first expand lung. Um, this was his initial x-ray on the left uh, that shows severe end-stage IPF. His donor organ had been refused by um, three centers ahead of ours. And this was his final post-transplant chest x-ray. And he's doing phenomenally well now, actually three years out of his transplant, which is, was remarkable. Um, this was data, I can't present the most updated data because that is being held for review uh, for the FDA, but this, is, this was the initial uh, data that was pr presented at the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation um, when we had 70 lungs instrumented on organ care system, eight lungs failed to meet criteria and were rejected. That gives us a utilization rate of 88%. That's very high. That means 62 of the lungs were transplanted. Um, 56 at that time had completed the 30-day follow-up. This is what the eligibility looks like to give you a sense. Uh, about a third of the lungs were low blood gases. About a third were for extended travel. Uh, about a third were for DCD. And by the way, in terms of extended travel, it's, that also is logistics. So let's say you don't have a surgeon available or you have ORs running on the recipient side. Several of the lungs that were included in this were left on the device for up to 12 hours before transplantation. Um, so logistics extending the cross-clamp time was allowed for inclusion. EVLP physiology, as I mentioned, a lot of the vascular resistance was elevated initially and would come down by the end. The same with peak airway pressures that would come down by the end. Oxygenation generally started lower, and then by the end, it improved. Survival at 30 days and in hospital was 95% at the time of presentation in ISHLT. So a clinical summary of EVLP, donor quality. Portable EVLP appears safe and offers the promise of reducing ischemic injury and improving organ quality. That's what the INSPIRE trial sought to address. Donor utilization. EVLP can monitor lungs to screen in lungs that were actually okay for transplant and otherwise were going to be discarded. That's what several trials have been showing, such as the ex vivo trials that were mentioned by Dr. Sanchez, as well as the EXPAND trial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lohr, uh, for a very um, interesting presentation. Also, uh, Dr. Sanchez, um, for those of you who have questions, bottom left-hand corner, just type in your question um, into the chat field, and I will also put up this poll while we're addressing the questions. For those of you listening in a group, please complete the poll so we can see how many people participated today. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we are a minute out from the top of the hour. We're going to go about five minutes past the hour to address questions for those of you who can stay on. And so I'm going to turn it to Chris to uh, pose those questions. And Chris, it looks like somebody had already submitted some questions earlier during Dr. Sanchez's presentation. Yep. Thanks, Heidi. So uh, we have a question from Lauren uh, from Gift of Hope in Illinois. <clears throat> and uh, basically, they're working on uh, maximizing their, their donor management uh, for uh, donors, and in particular, lung donors. And uh, she had a question uh, for both of you um, on uh, what your ideal guidelines for lung management uh, are in donors. And in particular, what are your thoughts on um, uh, volume versus pressure control settings in the ventilator, um, higher PEEP, uh, those, those type of things. So can you just give us a uh, just kind of a quick um, summary of what, what you think the ideal ventilator settings are for, for donors uh, in vivo? Um, yeah, so this is, this is Gabriel Orr from Baylor St. Luke's uh, in Houston. Um, I would say generally the, the, most OPOs do, do a great job with this, and uh, mostly uh, I think at least 70% of the country follows the SALT protocol from uh, San Antonio and very basic guidelines on uh, just maximizing the tidal volume and PEEP. In terms of the modes, generally when we accept the lung, uh, if, if a lung is going to work well, it's, it's going to work well in most modes. If we have to, the more creative we get, whether it's APRV or aggressive recruitment maneuvers, et cetera, the more that that's required to improve the oxygen levels, 
um, the the more likely that 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 lung may or may not have issues afterwards. We, my group, and I know many others. Um, um, do have a, a lot of reasonable experience with extended criteria donors, even blood gases below 300. But I, I think that's a general observation, is that the more steady the organ is at any baseline setting, um, the more confident you'll be. Um, whether it's assist control or, or pressure control, either of them work well. Um, from my standpoint, what I like to see is uh, uh, at least some of the gases being on a PIPA 5 or 8 um, with uh, volumes that target a CO2 somewhere in the um, high 30s to, to 40s, uh, and that's sort of what I what I look for. Dr. Sanchez, are you still here? I'm just oh, going to say, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. I'm just going to say any kind of mechanical ventilation is injurious to the lung. So we're just trying to support these donors for us to be able to use as many organs as we can. So um, I think there is a misconcept in, in, in the donor management community that organs will not be accepted if they don't meet a certain PO2. And, and that's when we start getting into trouble because that's when recruitment maneuvers can become injurious. That's when increased levels of PEEP can become injurious. And that's when, you know, certain methods of mechanical ventilation uh, like APRV can also injure the lung. Uh, so, with that in mind, I think, uh, like like uh, Gabriel said, I, I, I think there is a, a bigger understanding from the transplant surgeon community that uh, on not turning down lungs just because of the PO2 and uh, and going there and see and potentially uh, using ex vivo platforms to reevaluate or rescreen these organs if there are any doubts. I think the most important thing in donor management is diuresis. And, and that's one of the things that sometimes lags behind. Many times when you get offers, these patients are still, these donors are still severely volume overload. So I, I, will, I, I believe that it, an important guidelines is a volume, not in terms of tidal volume management, but in terms of diuresis management in, in these organs, in these, uh, in these donors. That's, that's, I guess the only thing that I have to add to what he was saying. Okay, thank you. I have another question uh, related to the EVLP platforms. Um, <clears throat> what do you think the greatest logistical challenges are with each of the systems that you presented today, the ex vivo, the Perfusix, and the, uh, the uh, Transmedics OCS? In terms of um, logistical challenges, you said? Yeah, logistical challenges with uh, the EVLP process itself. Yeah, um, so I can I can speak to the OCS one. Uh, the OCS one gets easier with time, uh, it, but it is definitely a more complicated procurement. Uh, instead of taking an organ and placing it directly in an ice bag, uh, you need you definitely need some specialized training to to get it hooked up um, to the device. And and then to transport it and to you know keep an eye on it uh, very carefully. I, I on the scale of one to ten in terms of how difficult it is, um, it's it's probably like a, uh, maybe like a four or five. It's not the most difficult, but it's not the easiest. Um, and uh, but you know we're we're fortunate that we have some of these first generation EVLP devices um, to to try to to start using these. Um, the OCS one does come uh, color coded with each part um, belonging to a specific color, so that makes it easier. There's an iPad application that helps us to kind of guide us through it. And there, most most folks who are in the trials will there tends to be a rep around that helps you with the first couple until you gain competency. So all of that helps, um, but it doesn't you know take the learning curve completely off. So it's important to keep. A certain set of competency expectations within the individual OPOs and within the individual um, hospitals. Uh, this is Paulo Sanchez. I agree. I think uh, any system that you're using, you know, getting used to the system, how it works, how do you use it to define what you're looking for, meaning how, what variables that you consider to define quality. They, they, they all require experience and training. So the more you do, the more confident you, you, you become uh, uh, in terms of how you 
using the system. And, and I think that's why this centers of perfusion idea has come to the table, you know, a center that only does ex vivo perfusion. So that's, that's uh, again, those centers itself have logistical concerns, you know. We don't really know what is what are the consequences of extending ischemic times uh, post ex vivo lamp perfusion. Uh, there's a couple of publications, I mean, one publication that came out of Toronto saying that it's okay, but within the novel trial, our experience was a little bit different, you know. The longer you call it semi time after ex vivo perfusion, you might start seeing some some uh, complications, like an increase in graph dysfunction. So we, we we still don't know in, uh, in, in those terms. Okay, thank you. I um, have, have another uh, donor uh, management question, maximizing, again, lungs for transplant. Do, uh, do either of you have a preference in uh, the antibiotic prophylaxis that's, that's used for donors? Um, are there certain antibiotics that are better for lungs, or do you uh, do you just um, uh, use whatever the the OPO is using? Um, yeah, I think that if the if the cultures grew out uh, gram positives and gram negatives, um, and especially if there's any concern for early or evolving pneumonia, um, then you probably want to go as. I mean, I tend to see this already happening and I and I don't disagree with it, which is just to go a little broader initially with vancomycin and, and zosin. And then the truth of the matter is what's it doing to the you know, to the native uh, microbiology of the organ, is that good or bad? I think that that's a, a very interesting question that we have to we have to study if we have registries that collect that degree of detailed data. Um otherwise in terms of just standard prophylaxis, uh, I'm not sure that it's entirely required, uh, but if, if someone has at least cefepime or, or ANSEF on board, that's sufficient. But if I see something that's suspicious for pneumonia, I'll, I'll typically trigger to go ahead and try to add um, vancrozosin or, uh, or cefepime, depending on uh, how, uh, how convincing it is for pneumonia. Yeah, same thing here, I agree. Okay, um, last question. Um, what do you guys think about the, what's the future of EVLP look like, do you think? Um, are we going to see advanced therapeutics such as gene and cell therapies, uh, even bioreactors growing new lungs? It, when, when do you think that we'll start seeing that? About the same time we see flying cars? <laughs> no, there's uh, there's already labs uh, trying to design uh, lungs. And so when I was at Minnesota, there was a lab by Angela uh, Mortari um, that uh, she, she's probably, she's got about 15 percent of the of the lung device, so she's got the skeleton like the exoskeleton up. Um, of course, if you just transplant that, it clots right away because it doesn't have any of the functioning cells. Um, but people are moving towards that direction. I think it's going to take a lot of time. Um, I think the future of EVLP right now. Um, there are some innovative things. Pablo spoke about a lot of really cool. Uh, things that the, that they've done uh, with the with the ex vivo platform in terms of recovering the organ, so moving beyond just uh, screening them, but moving on. You know, all of these systems have some standard milieu that you perfuse them with, the antibiotics and steroids and things like that. Um, and there's been a lot of research publications on different types of inhalational agents you can use to to truly kind of re rescue a lung that was going down. Uh, and but whenever you have these trials with brand new innovation, you kind of have to start slowly, and I think it'll probably take about five years or so for us to to really start to see cool trials that have recovered um, lungs that that were uh, injured and then became transplantable. Uh, that's kind of the the holy grail and doing it safely. I I agree. At, at the same time. Uh, when we're talking about therapeutics, uh, of course, you know, designing designing organs that do not, do not reject, it sounds pretty cool in some stuff already. We, uh, organs with
think we lost Dr. Sanchez there. I think uh, if I heard him correctly, it sounded like he was about to mention that there's already ongoing research in this, and and that is true. Uh, there, I mean, there's there's stuff we just don't hear about even too often. I can tell you at Pittsburgh and Mass General and several other centers are doing some nifty work with getting DNA into the organ while it's on EVLP and changing its blood type. I mean, amazing stuff. Um, so I, I think we're going to see a lot of this stuff coming out, um, and I hope that we're able to gain more traction um, from regulatory bodies to use these devices um, and hopefully in a more cost-effective way and then bring these futures to light. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Lohr, and um, thank you so much, Dr. Sanchez, both for your time. Um, I know Dr. Sanchez um, uh, kind of helped to present on this webinar on his cross-country move, so we appreciate um, your help, Dr. Sanchez, and um, understand that you had to use your cell phone for all of you who participated. Thank you for being patient through all of our audio challenges that we had today. Uh, sometimes those are the joys of technology that we have to deal with. Um, but thank you all so much, and thank you, Chris, for um, a great job at moderating the webinar. So everybody, I wish you all a wonderful rest of the week, and I'm going to move all of the speakers here back into the speaker room. Thank you all, and have a great day.